In the 2018 film Black Panther, we are first introduced to the main antagonist of the film, Eric Killmonger, in a very interesting way. He is seen at the Museum of Great Britain, a fictional museum in London, in the Western Africa section, where he meets with an alleged expert on the artifacts. Eric asks about the provenance of some of the objects, to which the curator rattles off places, dates, and cultural groups. One item he seems particularly interested in is an axe that the curator states was from the 7th century Benin. Tell me about this one. Also from Benin, 7th century. <clears throat> Fula tribe, I believe. Nah. I beg your pardon. It was taken by British soldiers in Benin, but it's from Wakanda. And it's made out of vibranium. <laughs> Don't trip. I'm gonna take it off your hands for you. These items aren't for sale. How do you think your ancestors got these? You think they paid a fair price? Or did they take it like they took everything else? The scene is really interesting as it highlights several things that are often overlooked by the average Joe who visits a museum or sees a traveling exhibit. Museums are filled with artifacts that were at one point stolen, looted, or unlawfully purchased. Some people argue that colonialism is over, that racism was defeated ages ago, and that everyone really just needs to be moving on with their lives. If you've been watching the news lately, you will hopefully understand that this isn't the case. Colonial history has instilled a systemic inequality that favors the white and trods down on everyone else. Museums are still filled with stolen loot, and people are still being murdered in the streets for no reason aside from their skin color. With the recent protests against police brutality targeting minorities, and with the Black Lives Matter movement picking up traction, I feel that it is an appropriate time to discuss reconciliation and confront the colonial nature of museums and the stolen goods they contain. My aim with this video is not to speak on behalf of those who have been oppressed, but rather to challenge other museum professionals to recognize the colonial traits in their own institutions and reconcile with minority groups in their community. Museums have an interesting niche in society. As trusted institutions, they should be doing more to give platforms and to help amplify the voices of those who need to be heard. Museums are not neutral. According to their website, the British Museum first opened in 1759 as the world's first museum to cover all fields of human knowledge. Over the two and a half centuries since their doors first opened to the public, the collection has grown through means of donations, general collection from antique enthusiasts, and archaeological excavations. But perhaps most significantly, the collection has grown through conflict. The Benin bronzes, the Admonition scroll, and the Elgin marbles are just a few of the items taken from their original locations through means of either dubious lawful purchase in times of conquest, or just straight up pillaging and looting by British soldiers. Decades, and in some case centuries, have passed since certain objects were taken, but despite the frequent appeals to have pieces repatriated, the British Museum stands firm with their no take backsies form. The museum continues to argue in favor of keeping the suspect objects they have in their collection. The general arguments of this are twofold. There is the argument that at this point the objects have become a part of British cultural heritage due to the longevity of their stay in the United Kingdom. There is no financial gain in keeping the pieces as the British Museum does not charge an entry fee, so anyone who wishes to see the objects are welcome to at any time during operation hours. Arguing from the standpoint that an artifact is a part of your own cultural heritage because it has sat in your museum for a long time is inherently flawed. Context is key to history. The context in which you read about a historical event or view an artifact from another culture greatly impacts the way you view an author or institution. As someone born in Africa, feeling a strong sense of connection to them. But despite all their beauty, they are, to me, tragic works of art because they are loaded with a sense of loss and that's because today they're not in nigeria among the people whose ancestors made them they're here in london in the british museum the argument of financial gain for the british museum is also brittle and that many of the most popular objects in the british museum are ones stolen from other countries they increase the visitation numbers and henceforth the number of individuals who exit through the gift shop or need an overpriced coffee at the museum cafe. 
It's also quite frustrating, as it isn't as if the British Museum does not have a massive collection that they could replace any repatriated objects with. It is estimated that less than 1% of the entire British Museum collection is actually on display to the public, and yet they continue to parade the objects that were taken in times of conflict. On June 5, 2020, the director of the British Museum, Hartwig Fisher, released a statement in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement. The British Museum stands in solidarity with the British black community, with the African American community, with the black community throughout the world. We are aligned with the spirit and soul of Black Lives Matter everywhere. We stand with everyone who is denied equal rights and protection from violence in the fullest sense of these terms. These are challenges that we as a society must address, injustices that must be overcome. It was not long before the internet tore this statement apart. It is interesting that the British Museum is so eager to throw their hat into the ring alongside this movement, as the Black Lives Matter movement stands against the very colonialism that the British Museum continues to perpetuate. You cannot spend entire centuries looting the world while refusing to give anything back and then say that you stand with the people you stole from the most. Hundreds of years of wrongdoings cannot be undone simply because the stuff that was stolen was given back. Which isn't to say that it isn't a positive step in the right direction, but more is truly needed to truly acknowledge the harm that was inflicted. At the end of the day, the objects don't matter. The people who were crushed under the colonial heel are who matter. The systemic inequality that has pervaded society against people of color is what matters. And unfortunately, simply giving back what was stolen will never be enough. Because it wasn't just objects that were stolen. In 1689, a British sea merchant known as Edward Colston joined the Royal African Company as a deputy governor. While the Royal African Company was originally founded for the purpose of extracting gold from up the Gambia River, it would ship more African slaves than any other company during the Atlantic slave trade. It is estimated that while Edward Colston was a member of the RAC, tens of thousands of men, women, and children were shipped across the Atlantic Ocean where they were sold to work on plantations under brutal conditions. It is estimated that of the literal thousands of people stolen from the African continent, 22% died on the journey, and those who made it were subject to a life of enslavement. Edward Colston made a killing off the suffering of other human beings, and 174 years after he finally died, a statue was erected in his likeness in Bristol, England, on a street that was named after him. It stood for 125 years before it fell into the bay. The term damnatia memoriae, or damnation of memory, refers to the attempt of groups or individuals to strike an individual from the historical record. This often occurred after a political figure either died or fell from power, and either political rivals or the public would tear down their images, deface their monuments, and remove any mention of their name from the records. We know who Akhenaten is despite his name being removed from the list of the pharaohs. We know who Gita is despite the attempts of Caracalla, and despite the efforts to destroy a female pharaoh's memory, Hatshepsut is remembered. With the recent protests, recognition of statues and other physical celebrations of white supremacy are on the rise, and many monuments are receiving similar treatments to the statue of Edward Colston in Bristol. A statue of Christopher Columbus was beheaded in Boston, and dozens of Confederate statues were graffitied or given alterations across the United States. Many critics insist that this is a willful destruction of the past, and that such acts will erase these people from the fabric of human history. As we have seen with Emperor Gita and Hatshepsut, we know that this isn't the case, and is just a willful misunderstanding by the people who critique such acts. The aim of tearing these statues down is not to erase history, but rather to destroy the celebration of white supremacy that they represent. I would like to suggest to my museum colleagues across the world that they accession these statues into their collections. If people are so concerned about the erasure of history, let's display them. Let's talk about them, spray paint and all. But let's tell the full story about the people these hunks of bronze and marble personify. Let's recontextualize why a group of people felt the need to take down a reminder of the fact that their ancestors were brutalized by the white powers that be. Let's talk about how the consequences of their actions are still felt in society today, and how the echo of the systems put in place centuries ago are still painful ringing in the ears of minority communities. The 
Black Lives Matter movement has been documented in many different mediums across every corner of social media. After all, the 2020 protests were spurred by a video of a man being murdered. Institutions are collecting signs, photographs, and interviews with protesters so that one day these events can be offered as an educational moment for future generations, and also a reminder to the current generation that the fight is not over. Many of the statues that were taken down, including the Edward Colston statue, are being accessioned into museums. Hopefully they are able to recontextualize the individual cast in bronze, and also explain why his patina has been painted red and splashed with the BLM logo. The work that is currently falling to people who work in museums is not just to curate a future exhibit exploring the protests of 2020, but to take a fresh look at the collections that they already have. Museums are an avenue to history for the public, and how we tell our stories is more important than ever. Who is telling the story? How are we displaying our objects? Are we misrepresenting the provenance of an object? Is the culture of the object absent from its display or its explanation? How did it come to be in the collection? Was its accessioning ethical? These are just some of the questions that I challenge museum professionals to ask themselves. Museums are not neutral. Historically, they have been colonial warehouses that store the goods of conquered nations. This cannot be the future of museums, and it is the duty of the museum community to recognize the issues of their own institutions, and to do everything in their power to remedy them. But we also have the ability to help amplify the voices of those who have historically suffered. Museums are not neutral.